This is the Productized Podcast. My name is Brian Castle. Thanks for tuning in. Today, you're going to hear my conversation with Travis Northcutt. He is behind memberup.co. He's been a longtime uh, consultant and expert in all things membership sites. So I really uh, picked Travis's brain quite a bit on you know, setting up a membership site is something that I've been thinking about doing for the productized community. Kind of have a membership site there, if you will, but it's not like the typical ongoing recurring membership, which is something that I always thought about moving to at some point. Um, so Travis is an expert in membership sites, but also with WordPress, and especially setting up a membership site on WordPress. And so we talked all about the various tools and and best practices and strategies that one might use if that's something that you're thinking about doing. Travis is also working on a book when it comes to managing and launching and growing your membership site, which you will certainly want to check out. But without further ado, here is my conversation with Travis Northcutt talking about membership sites. Enjoy. Okay, I'm here with Travis Northcutt. Travis, how's it going, man? Pretty good, Brian. How are you doing? Good. So uh, great to kind of catch up with you. You and I have known each other on the uh, internets for a couple of years now in the WordPress circles, the startup circles, the online business circles, the traveling while working and having kids <laughs> community as well. Yeah, it's cool how much overlap there is with us. It's cool. So there are definitely more and more of us who are running these businesses, working from home, but then taking that on the road. And so we were just talking offline before this. You're coming from California right now, but you guys have been on the road for over a year, huh? Yeah, we sold our house in Central Texas about a year and a couple months ago. And uh, we've been full time since then. And it's been great. Uh, I tell people it's like 80% awesome and 20% awful. Um, right. <laughs> but that's, you know, it's, that's kind of like parenting anyway. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. New totally. perspectives and stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I could spend an entire episode, maybe we will at some point, talking about traveling and work. And we did it for about six months last year. Um, and you've been on the road for over a year. Maybe we'll get Brecht on here. He's done it for a couple of years. And Jordan, at some point, we'll do that. But uh, anyway, for this episode, I really wanted to talk to you because you've kind of become like the membership guy. But before we get all into that, let's just kind of start from the top. I mean, tell us about your site, Member Up, and just what do you do and kind of what are you focused on right now this year? Yeah, so I work exclusively with membership sites, and most people probably have some idea what that is. But if they don't, it's you know it's usually some type of like training or educational type site, and I usually throw in the stipulation that a membership site means some type of subscription revenue model, and there's often like a community discussion forums or Slack or Facebook stuff like that. So that's my thing. Yeah, and we do custom development, uh, we do full site development, and my favorite thing is doing kind of strategy consultation because there's for a lot of these membership sites there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that people either aren't aware of or just don't know what direction to go with things and uh, there's a lot of room there for a lot of people very nice so like who is a typical client or a typical project for you guys so a good example would be there's a website called CG Cookie, as in Computer Graphics Cookie. Uh, and we've done work with them uh, over the past two, maybe three years now, um, just various things here and there. And they teach computer graphics like animation, 3D modeling, stuff like that. So they have like extensive library of video courses and then discussion forums and stuff like that. And so when someone works with your company, do they come to you like they're an existing membership site and they want to do an overhaul, you know, migrate to some new platform? Or is it some expert who wants to start up a, a membership site or do you see kind of both? Or Yeah, I would tend to see both. Probably more of the people I get approaching me are they already have some type of membership site going. We get a decent number of referrals from plugin authors for WordPress. Uh, there's quite a few membership plugins for WordPress. And so we'll get people who come to them for support because they want to do some custom thing. And most plugin shops don't do custom development, so they'll send them our way. But we do get a decent number of people who are you know, looking to start a site. And that's great when somebody's an expert in their area you know, to be able to kind of help them 
build that new business. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, later in this conversation, we're definitely going to do a deep dive into membership business models, membership sites, how to get it going, some best practices. I want to pick your brain personally, because I've been thinking about maybe moving to a membership model for my productized program at some point. I don't know when, but so I definitely want to hear, I'm just selfish. I want to pick your brain about that stuff. Ah, that's perfect. The best questions. Yeah. So uh, before we get into all that, like, as always, I try to get, you know, a bit of your story in here and kind of get a feel for what, what you're working on and like behind the scenes. So I mean, you come from a web development and WordPress development design background. Is that right? Yeah. So I've been doing, gosh, I don't actually know how long, probably six or so years now, six or seven years, kind of just first just did generic kind of WordPress development. Me and a partner who we were friends before, I'd known each other for a long time, and he was more of the design side, I was more of the development side. And so we would just build, first started just locally where we lived, you know, just WordPress kind of brochure websites, typically call them. And then at some point, we knew we wanted to specialize, kind of knew the appeal of that and had a client who wanted to launch a membership site. And we did that with them. And it was kind of like, oh, yeah, we could do this. This could be like a thing, you know, kind of niche and that uh, which kind of evolved from there. There are a lot of web designers and developers and even WordPress folks who never make that switch, who never find that focus or that niche or that ideal client. I mean, how did you do that? So you had one client who was a membership site. What were the actual steps that you took to change your business to focus around that? That's a good question. So we, like I said, we kind of knew we wanted to find some area of focus and, and didn't really know what that would be. We just knew from reading and talking to other people that that would be a profitable move, you know, a profitable shift to make and an enjoyable one from people we had, you know, talked to. Um, and so it happened with that one that we did some work for that client. And then the plugin that he was using to run his membership site, I talked to those guys who developed that plugin. And I think it started off because I had made some suggestions like, hey, if you change this, you know, here's some a way you can improve the plugin. And they loved that and said, oh, can we add you to our list of like recommended contractors, you know? And so then we got more leads from there and it just kind of snowballed at that point. Very cool. And we'll get into more of the tech stuff a little bit later, but like from a business standpoint, are you focused on a certain plugin or a certain set of plugins? Or Because I know that there are so many different membership systems out there. Yeah, I'm not really focused on a certain one. There are a few that we see as, you know, that we typically end up working with because like I said, it snowballs, the referrals kind of build on, on themselves. My favorite one right now is Restrict Content Pro. It's just, it's really straightforward and simple, but really flexible. And so we do a lot of customization. And so it, it really enables that really well. But there's a number of other good ones that are great options. You know, they all have kind of different feature sets and stuff. And Yeah, I've been using uh, Restrict Content Pro uh, from Pippin for a while now for the productized course. Yeah, it's been nice to just be able to throw it in there. It gives me the functionality I need, and then I can design it however I want, which is cool. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so nice. And so was it overnight? A lot of web designers, again, like I I don't want to like brush over that because I know how difficult it is to wrap your head around this idea of like, okay, I've been working with universities and e-commerce and blogs and doctors and lawyers and restaurants, and now I'm just going to focus on one. Like, how did you start to make that transition? And also like, what were you able to do from a marketing standpoint to be like, all right, we're going to put up our shingle and say, we are for membership sites and not for these other things. Yeah. Um, so there were a few kind of key factors there. One was we were, me and my partner, I don't have a partner anymore. We can touch on that later. But at the time, we were both in a, a mastermind group. And there was one guy in particular in that group. His name is Philip Morgan. So that explains it. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So you know Philip Morgan. Yeah. He was instrumental in that helping us along, nurturing us through that process of like, because it's scary, right? Like it's like, if, okay, if I just kind of say, I'm only working with this narrow focus now, am I going to lose all my leads? Like what's going to happen? Yeah. If you guys don't know uh, Philip Morgan, I had a great conversation with him on this podcast, which we did last year. It's one of the earlier episodes. You could check that out, but just check out Philip Morgan's book and his site. He talks all about positioning and really focusing it on a niche and ideal customer. He's really the go-to guy for that. Yeah, he totally is. He's he's so, yeah, he's made himself the guy on positioning. But he encourages to look at it from a perspective of like, look, if you say that you're going to focus on membership sites, you can always undo that. Like, you don't have to look at it as like this, you know, no going back thing, right? 
And also in the meantime, until that kind of, you know, that lead funnel builds up, you can still do other projects. You know, you don't have to turn down people who come to you with money, you know? Exactly. And like, just because your website says something very focused on a niche, you're still going to get personal referrals from your network. Totally. Yes. And just take those as long as you need to. And then at some point you say, maybe you just start raising your prices and say, okay, I'll still take those because it's profitable. And then maybe at some point you don't, you just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be exclusive. And that's that. And we did, you know, it was a, it was an extended transition for us. We went through that. It wasn't an overnight thing. And eventually we rebranded and bought a new domain name and did that whole thing, but it wasn't overnight. Yeah. And then it, it gets to a point where, you know, the benefits start to outweigh the drawbacks of not niching down, right? Because once you are niched down or once you start to make go in that direction, all these new opportunities open up from a marketing standpoint. Like you can actively go out there and market yourself. You can have, you can develop partnerships with plugins. You can, you know, do content marketing, do advertising. Like you can't do that stuff if you're marketing to everyone in the world. Yeah, totally. And if people, once you become like, okay, that's your thing and you get known for that just a little bit, then it builds on itself so much because then if somebody who's a generalist and they have a client come to them and it's maybe not a perfect fit, but that client is like, they want to build a membership site, they're going to refer them to us if they know us because we're the ones that they know who focus on that as opposed to just, I don't know, somebody, you know, find find a developer somewhere. Yep. And when you think about from the customer's perspective, they land on your site or they meet you or hear about you. It's like, wow, this person is here for me and they know my problems inside and out. So, you know, comparing you to even another just generalist WordPress web developer who probably knows those plugins perfectly inside and out. But when you position yourself as having solved that problem again and again and again, you're going to win that that business every time. Yeah, totally. And yeah, exactly like you said, it's not a knock on other people who are generalists at all. Because yeah, there are plenty of people who are are great, just as good as us. But like you said, we're kind of starting almost at the finish line at that point because it just clicks with people. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, actually, from a marketing standpoint, like, what are you doing these days? Get out there. Like to bring in that business, yeah. Um, I mean, it is like just about completely. No, it is completely like word of mouth at this point. I don't do any paid advertising. I have an email list that we, I've managed to build up, you know, pretty decent size for our size of a, of a shop, and so that's nice. Um, I actually started a. A couple of weeks ago, I, I started sending daily emails to my list. So we could talk more about that. It's uh, a daunting thing at first, but it's actually pretty fun. I noticed that your drip pop-ups, uh, like the, the call to action is daily membership tips. So did you just queue up 52 tips or actually 365 tips or or you're actually writing it new every day? I'm writing a new broadcast every day. Yeah. Or just about it. I send pretty much just send on, on weekdays at this point. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I try to stay ahead of it right now. I'm, I'm not, you know, just we've had some friends visiting and so I got busy and so I'm writing the next morning's email each day. It's a cool challenge. Yeah. And there's some, we could, if you want, we, you know, we, that's another thing that could be most of an episode, but there's some cool benefits there. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm curious. Like, let's spend a minute on it. So, you're taking time out of your day, out of every single day, every work weekday at least. Like, are these long emails? Are they like short? Like, what? Yeah, uh, they're pretty short. Yeah, probably around 500 words is typical. Uh, maybe you know, 250 to 700 words. I mean, I haven't counted you know very many, but that's probably typical. Yeah. And so, you're speaking to membership site owners, obviously. And like, are you giving away like advanced tips, or what are you putting into that? Sometimes it's just really. Now, I don't I don't want to say shallow, but sometimes it's not like a real deep dive on something. It's just sort of a like, hey, here's a tip. It might even be like a new way to think about something. <laughs> like I sent one and this kind of touches on another point of like, where do you get the inspiration, you know, like for what to write? If people want to do that, the, the huge thing there is don't be boring, right? It would be so easy to just like, okay, I'm going to teach you about some stuff and here's the dry, you know, details. But just like, I just try to gather inspiration from wherever I can. So the other day we went on a hike, like after dinner, just a short one, like out of this, the neighborhood where we're staying. And we went somewhere we hadn't been before. And we ended up on like the most beautiful overlook of, it's like, looks over the entire lake of Lake Tahoe. We've been here like two years before and we just never found it. And so I turned that into an email like, hey, sometimes just go with your gut and try a new thing in your business. And so it's not always like nitty gritty membership site, super technical strategy stuff. Yeah, but people connect with the personal story. Totally. Yes. 
Yeah, and that's huge. And other times it is like a deeper dive on something about like churn or upsells or something like that. That's also something I've been wanting to do for a while. Like something like I, every year I want to launch something around January 1st. I don't know whether I'll actually do it this coming January or not, but I want to launch like a year long thing. Like the program is like a year of learning to productize your service or something. And you're going to get a new tip every week for a year or every day for a year. And I, I mean, I tend to like try to plan it in the head and <laughs> I'll just bang it out on for like a month and have these things like pre queued up for the whole year. And then just like kind of set it and forget it. But I don't know. One of these years I'm going to do something like that. We'll see. And for me, it's interesting that you say that because for me, the part of the the key for this has actually been that it's not like a planned out thing. And that's just a personality thing, right? Like I'm less of a type A, like plan everything out person. And so it's just like, it's key that it's just spur of the moment, like new inspiration each day, you know. So tell me about the book. Like when did that come out and uh, what's that all about? Yeah, so that's, that's we've been selling that for quite a while. And we initially wrote that as more of a sort of an authority builder type thing than a like profit center. Uh, we sell it for pretty cheap. Actually, just this morning, I, I was like, I should bump the price on that because we've had it at $19 forever. And so I bumped it for t- to $29. But it's just kind of a, a general overview of strategies for running a membership site. Uh, touches on a number of different things. And it's sort of a, a high level overview of a lot of what you need to know to run a membership site. Um, it actually deserves like a refresh. It's been on my, on my mind for the past month or so to go through that and kind of release an updated version. Yeah, very cool. And I could totally see how it positions you as the expert. There's a lot of really valuable information. It looks like there's an option to get a consulting session with it. Yeah. Which yeah. is really cool. And I could certainly see how that would lead into working with you on a project or something. Yeah, it's been a good sort of a stands up there as like, oh, well, we wrote the book on this topic. So we at least know, like, we probably know something. So you should probably talk to us at least, you know, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Have you thought about starting a membership site? <laughs> That's a really good question. I have thought about that for the size, like like right now it's me and then I have a, a contractor, a developer who, who works with me on projects. So that would be, I think, bite enough more than I could chew right now. And also there's a really good, there's something called the Member Site Academy. It's run by two people. They're actually in, a, in England and they're great. Like it's, I think, $50 a month and I'm a member there because it's just a great place for me to interact with people who are, you know, run membership sites and they have an enormous library of content and it's just really good. And so it'd kind of be like, well, they already do that really, really well. So, yeah. but actually, I'm actually right now in the process of beta testing phase of a, a SaaS app for membership sites. So I'm kind of going that direction with the thing for membership people. Oh, you're building one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, nice. So like, that'll be like a membership kind of platform. No, it's it's for people who are already running a membership site. It's, it helps people reduce churn and increase upsells. That's kind of the key focus of it. It's, it's a uh, kind of measures member engagement. So, you know, most of these membership sites, they have content on their site. They ideally have uh, some type of discussion forum. And then they're sending out emails to people, right? And so we're measuring their customers' interaction with all those different places and kind of giving them like, hey, you know, Joe Smith hasn't like been to your site or done anything in the last like three weeks, you know, you should reach out to him because he's probably going to cancel if you don't. Yeah, that's awesome. We should get into it here. But like, I know that churn and retention is the biggest headache for especially for membership sites. I mean, definitely for SaaS too, but I probably even more so for membership sites. Yeah, definitely more so because there's a lower barrier, like it's less painful to cancel. Like if you're using a SaaS app, it's a tool kind of in your workflow, whatever you're doing. And so it's like, okay, I got to figure out a replacement for that. But if it's a membership site that's training or, you know, educational, it's like, well, I can just stop. Yeah. It's kind of nice to have, or you were a beginner when you started and now you're more advanced. Exactly. So yeah, that's a huge pain point and low hanging fruit for so many sites. A lot of sites aren't already measuring that stuff. And so there's tons of room for improvement there. You know, the old saying about only improve what you measure or whatever that quote is really rings true here. Yeah, totally. So let's get into it a little bit. So all right. When we say the word membership site, I feel like that's super broad. Oh, yeah. Like what kind of buckets would you break it down? Like what are the different types of membership sites that we would think about? Um, I, You know, that's a really good question. I don't kind of have a, a framework for thinking about types of membership sites, but my kind of criteria are 
that there's some type of content, right? Sort of pre-done content. You know, a lot of times that's video courses, but it could be text or audio, whatever, that lives on a site that you, you know, you join, you get access to that, you log in, you get to view that content. And then ideally, like I push almost everybody to have some type of community component too, right? Discussion forums, discourse is for technology. That's my favorite, but there's other options that are great. And that's kind of a key component. And that's an awesome strategy for reducing that churn and extending the lifetime of a customer. I feel like the community aspect, you know, the training stuff, the videos, the lessons, like that will run out and you could keep turning new stuff out, but still you'll be rehashing the same topics. Like, but the community is something that if it's active and if people are engaged with each other, then they'll stick around for a while. But if it's dead, that could also lead to churn too. Yes. That could be a turnoff at that point. Yeah, totally. That community thing, it's something that they can interact with long term. And it's also something that people can build an emotional connection to. You know, they like build these relationships with other people who are in the same boat and then they don't want to let that go, right? Like these become their people, you know? And so that's like a huge thing. You know, it's interesting. I was, um, I'm just thinking about like memberships that I'm a member of. And, you know, I remember for a while I was a paid member of Mixergy and I'm no longer, I love Mixergy and everything that Andrew has done. And for a while I was a member there just to access the premium courses. But then after like two years of being a member, I kind of felt like, you know, I like the interviews, but I don't really need the courses anymore. And there was no community aspect to keep me connected. Whereas another one that I'm a member of is Dynamite Circle, the guys who run Tropical MBA. And I'm not even super active there. I might hop in like three times a year, if that. But just knowing that I have a membership and I can go there and I can connect with people if and when I need to, it's just great to... And there's so so much activity in that forum that like any topic that I need to hear about, I could just check out what people are talking about. Yeah. And you can get like... You can hear from people who've been there, done that before. That's an enormous benefit of having that. Totally. So when you think about membership sites, does it tend to be more like personal brands, like experts who then build a membership out of their audience? Or can membership sites also come from a company? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. The ones that I see tend to be more along the lines of that personal brand, sort of an expert or maybe a small group of experts who've started small and then built up an audience. A good example of that is a a website called kelbyone.com. Anybody who's into photography, I'm sure has heard of that site. And it's this guy named Scott Kelby. And he like over decades has been like the photography and Photoshop guy. Like he's run a conference, a magazine, like before there was you know much stuff on the web, he was doing stuff in print and person. Right. And so now he has this big team and it's this huge business. Like you said, you know, he's kind of like a noted expert in his field. Right. And sort of trades on that. But there are bigger ones too, you know, like lynda.com. That's a member membership site, but that's not like one person, you know, they have tons and tons of teachers and stuff. And it's also like a membership site for course teachers too. Like anybody can kind of become a teacher. Well, not maybe not anybody, but they reach out to other people to come in and teach courses. And so that that's kind of like another offshoot of this model. Like it's not just one company or one person creating the content, but sometimes they do in a way like crowdsource the course material. If you look at like Mixer G and, and other ones. Right. Totally. So let's talk about churn, right? I mean, that is the thing that really trips people up. Cause like when you think about it, like if you've maybe been, you've been selling a book or you've been selling some consulting and you think about the thought of, okay, I'm going to launch this recurring revenue subscription membership site. It's going to be beautiful. All these people are going to sign up and then I'm going to get paid every month. Yeah. It sounds awesome. (laughs) You know, it, it sounds awesome, but like, I know how painful that churn issue can be. If people are churning out after two months, it's just not going to really sustain. So what do you think a causes such a high churn rate with membership sites and b like any tips to reduce it? Yeah. So causes the biggest thing in my mind is just level of engagement. You know, if people are not engaged with your site, with what they're paying for, then at some point they're going to kind of make that decision, that emotional decision like, okay, this isn't worth it for me anymore. Whereas if it's something that people are really engaged with and they keep coming back to, if it's the content that they're consuming, I hate that consuming content, you know, but <laughs> but that's the term people understand. Then if they keep coming back to that, then that's because it's bringing value into their life and they're more likely to stick around a lot longer. And when we talked about the community aspect, that's enormous too. And you know, I guess from a pricing standpoint, I've heard some advice. I think it makes sense. I mean, definitely you need to deliver value and solve an ongoing 
problem and provide that engagement month after month after month. But with membership sites specifically, I think a better practice tends to be to price it per quarter or per year or for a six month term rather than going month by month. Because if you build in that lifetime value from the start, obviously you can capture the lifetime value up front, but it also puts the customer in a mindset of like, okay, I'm going to actually commit to making this work and getting myself engaged over the next three, six, 12 months. Yeah, absolutely. I really encourage people to have a a monthly offer and then an annual offer and make that annual one just really attractive. A really typical thing is like you pay uh, as if you were paying for 10 months, but you get a year. That's typical. Sometimes it makes sense to discount it even more just to really emphasize the value of that annual option. Yeah. And then the other thing to do that I would say most people don't is when people sign up for a monthly plan, like after maybe a month or two months, pitch them an annual offer individualized for them. Just put that in your email automation. Maybe at that point, they're like, okay, yeah, I'm going to stick around. I'll go ahead and get that discount for the annual at that point. Yeah, I like it. So how about on pricing and packaging perspective? I guess, obviously, it depends on the industry. Some industries are, you know, if you're selling to businesses versus consumers and selling to high end versus low end. So price points may vary, I guess. But I mean, from what I can tell, like from a monthly basis, you're not going to get super high priced for a membership site. Like a tool could be a several hundred dollars a month, but going beyond the $50 a month range for just information or community seems a bit high. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that can be a, anything higher than, and, and that's a, probably a pretty good sort of level to think about it in terms of that, that kind of $50 a month. Anything higher than that can be a pretty hard sell, especially when it's not necessarily a B2B kind of thing. You know, if, if it's a hobby type thing or in the case of like photography, it, it might be their business, but often a, they're solo. And so there's not, they're not spending somebody else's money, right? So anytime someone's spending their own money, yeah, that can be a hard sell. The exception to that is some more narrow, like really, really narrow specialized types of sites that oftentimes can justify a much higher price tag. But that's because either they're really established as the leader or there's just a really clear ROI there for people. Right. And so how about like what to include in the package that you're paying for? So we talked about community having access to some sort of forum or chat room or something. And I'm actually curious about like discourse forums versus Slack versus both. But in addition to that, like what else? So like, does there have to be a course like educational component? Should there be coaching? Should there be like office hours, group coaching? What kind of works here? Really, it depends on the audience. And all of those things are good things for people to kind of consider and to evaluate. And that can be in terms of like what your audience might like. It can also be in terms of like what you can easily do. You know, if you're a team of one, then you have to really focus on stuff that scales versus stuff like doing one-on-one coaching, depending on the price tag you put in on it and what kind of processes you have in place, right? Um, That can be a really good upsell, that one-on-one coaching or group coaching, you know, letting people opt into a higher tier where they get like a monthly group call, that kind of stuff. Uh, It can be a really good thing to kind of throw in there. Yeah. I've been thinking about doing that with Productize. Like currently, it's just a one-time, you buy the course and there's two options. It's either the course or the course plus one coaching session. And at some point, I've been thinking about converting this to some sort of membership where it's still the course and then an option to get access to the membership, which will turn away from being lifetime access into some sort of like six month or 12 month term. And then an option to upsell into a group coaching program, which it's me plus a group of just five of us. And it's like a monthly mastermind call. And it's like a six month program that you buy into. Yeah. And for some type of membership sites, something like that can be really good because there's sort of an initial period where people are like, they're consuming all this content and they're really leveling up fast. And that one-on-one or kind of small groups setting can really accelerate that for them, right? That's when they're going to have the most questions. That's when they're going to be the most eager is sort of that initial period. Yeah. A while back, like a year or two ago, I joined the Fizzle membership, Mm -hmm. mostly because I was just a fan of their podcast. And also because I kind of wanted to like spy on <laughs> on how they, they structure their, their membership and their content. Totally. Yeah. I've just been a fan of those guys and, and everything that they've been doing. And I, I thought that one interesting thing that they did, they grew their membership and, and they had this library of courses for a while, but then they structured it into a roadmap, right? So like new members, I think that it's something like a three month roadmap to follow these courses, go in this order and you will achieve X result. 
And it's kind of like a path that they can follow on a certain schedule, which I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's a huge, huge thing for engagement. Once you have like a lot of content like that, that can become really daunting, right? If you just like throw somebody into the deep end, like, okay, here's all the stuff. Good luck. You know, if there's no kind of guided path like that, then doing something like that really boosts engagement and kind of makes things stick long term. Right. And how about dripping out the content versus just giving it all up front, but maybe with some sort of roadmap, like you should go down this path first. I mean, I tend to want to just give it all up front because I know that there will be some people who want to go through it much faster, you know, and others who want to take it slower. But yeah, like I, I think that some membership platforms allow you to limit it so that like you have to go through module one before you can get to module two. Right. Yeah. Some of them do. I am generally not in favor of dripping content out, especially if it's like a time based drip, right? Where you get, okay, you get this week one, then you get this week two. Cause like you said, if people want to go through it fast, like then they're just sitting there like, okay, I paid for this. Now what? It can make sense to do, and that would be more of like a an LMS thing, like a learning management system where you, okay, you've completed module one, now you get module two, then you get module three. That can make sense for sure if it's a really structured, what you're teaching is really structured. That does make sense to me. But in most cases, I am in favor of like, just give full access. And people worry about like, okay, people are going to join for a month and then steal all my stuff and then cancel. And I say, one, cross that bridge when you get to it. Like if you see that happening, okay, then do something about that. And then two, those people weren't going to stick around for a long time anyway. If you drip that content, like those aren't your people, you know, like don't worry about those people. Yeah. And and there's like a value problem there too, right? Like, and that's the issue. I feel like there are a lot of info product creators who are trying to fit their info product into a membership model when really it's just an info product. Yes. And it should be a standalone one-time thing. Yeah. Like you have to add that community engagement. And I guess that that doesn't just mean bolting on a Slack room or, or, or a forum, you know, like you have to actually make the effort to engage in there. And, you know, I, I've seen some folks who, you know, Brennan Dunn actually does a really good job of this too with his, I think he's got like multiple membership areas across his products where he actually brings in other experts to do like guest teaching and guest coaching and stuff like that. So how about that idea of like with a forum, like currently I have a discourse forum, which I really like, but earlier on, like when I very first early days of productize, I started it like a private Facebook group. Mostly because that was the fastest, easiest thing to launch. And I didn't know how well the course was going to do. And then six months in, I had some complaints about the Facebook group. Like people didn't want to be on Facebook and I wanted to go to discourse, but I had to hire some discourse developers to migrate our conversations from Facebook into discourse. And they actually did that, but I don't know, 50% of them didn't carry over. And then more recently than that, I've had requests to launch a Slack room for productized members, which... I think I would like to do at some point, but then it's like, well, what do I do with the forum? Like, like, so any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think my general, well, on that last thing, yeah, you got to be careful about fragmenting stuff for sure. For a membership site where people are joining and part of a long-term community, I am way more in favor of something like discourse or another discussion forum than I am something like Slack. One Slack can get pretty overwhelming if there's a lot of people in there. You know, it's just, it can be hard to keep up. People can be like, you know, they pop in and it's like, what is going on? Like you're in the middle of a conversation, you know? And so, and it, frankly, it can get pricey. If you're doing a paid tier, it can get pricey, you know, once you've got a good number of people in there. Right. Because Slack charges per user. Yeah. And it's like six bucks a user or something. And that can be, you know, if you're charging 20, 30 bucks a month, like, that's not insignificant. So that's kind of my general feeling on that. I actually have a, an article on my site about that exact question, like discourse, Facebook, and Slack. Uh, so generally speaking, my feelings on Facebook are, one, personally a little bit cynical <laughs> about Facebook. You know, they're this giant thing. You mean like your stuff lives on Facebook and who knows what they're going to do with it? Yeah. And that's the more pragmatic side is not just like my personal feelings, but you're playing in someone else's sandbox, right? Like 
they're going to do whatever they want. There have been instances of people like, you know, have a private group on Facebook, but ads show up in there sometimes. They control, you know, if you can message people, like that could change overnight, um, all this stuff. So I am pretty negative on that. Like there's a huge, there's good things to be said in favor of it. Like people are already there. You know, if they go there for just personal use of Facebook, they might see then, oh, there's new posts in the Facebook group. So like, yeah, there's some cool stuff there. I do think there that is a benefit. And and I agree with you. Like that's why I migrated off of the Facebook group. But I am a member of a couple of business focused Facebook groups and like they pull me right in. Like when I'm in there checking out baby pictures of my friends, like then all of a sudden I find myself talking about like drip automation and Yeah, you see that little red dot up there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It does kind of keep you connected at least. Yes. But the inverse is true also. Like if people go there for your thing, then they're gonna see that red dot up there for other stuff and like, oh, look, something shiny, you know? So it's a double edged sword for sure. Totally. So the hesitation that I've always had about moving to a membership model rather than what I have now, which is just a one-time sale, is that what I love about it is that it's almost completely passive for me right now. Like when I sell courses, it's passive. I do a couple of coaching sessions a month, like just one off for the folks who buy that. And I enjoy that piece of it, but still that's not a ton of time. And I can ramp that up and ramp that down anytime that I need to. So the hesitation that I've had, I'm sure other people have, is you move into a membership site. Now it's on you to commit to get in there, get into the forum, be active, you know, launch new content for members, bring in guests, do office hours. Like, have you worked with anyone who deals with that and they've found like good systems to make the personal commitment, personal management manageable? Um, you know, my general feeling on that is. One, I haven't, nobody comes to mind who's kind of done that struggle. I mean, everybody deals with time issues, right? Like if there were 30 hours in a day, oh my God, that'd be awesome. I mean, I guess like if the membership site is your main business, yes. then like for me, I'm running another business. Like I can't just do that full time. Yeah. And that becomes hard and you have to either plan a ton of stuff in advance before you make that transition, which can work, right? Like, you know, you see the discussion forum with kind of new questions and prompts for people to engage several times a week for, you know, however long it takes until that kind of gains its own momentum. But yeah, that initial period can be, it can be really tedious and a lot of work. Like you're wanting all these people who are paying you money to be engaged. Well, you better be like, even way more engaged than you want them to be. Like you got to really show up and uh, they need to see that. Yeah. Like ask questions, answer questions, just start conversations. Start conversations. And also a thing I tell people is one, yeah, don't let a question go unanswered for more than like a day, you know, get in there. You want to be, if somebody else doesn't answer it pretty soon, then at least do something. And then also pull in other people who, you know, like, oh, well, so-and-so has been through that exact thing in discourse, at least, you you know, you tag them and like pull them into that conversation. Kind of doing that, that grunt work is huge. That's really cool. I know early on, a few people have done this in the productized form where they've partnered up and built their own mastermind groups around productize. The Dynamite Circle does a really good job of that. So they, I think every couple of months, they have like a whole system and program where they're just asking for applications to join a mastermind group and they're getting their members to mastermind up basically, which I think is a really good idea. Yeah, that can be another huge benefit of that community for people is like that opportunity to make those connections. And then, you know, you as the business owner facilitating that and encouraging that is, yeah, that's huge for sure. Awesome. Um, So yeah, I mean, let's just kind of finish up real quick with a couple of tools and tech and stuff. Yeah. When you think about a membership site, people go right to like, okay, what's the best plugin? Like if I get that plugin, I'll be successful. Like, no, obviously it's all about the content and the value and getting these questions like we just discussed all figured out. But at the end of the day, like you need to figure out how to run the thing. So obviously you're a WordPress guy. First of all, like WordPress versus not using WordPress for a membership site. Yeah. My general thought there is I'm definitely biased because of my background and I fall in the favor of of using WordPress because then it's like you own it, you know, it's yours. It's not going to change kind of out from under you. There are some good hosted platforms. Uh, Kajabi is one that's pretty popular that I know of, but I do because eventually people almost inevitably want some custom functionality that they're not going to get out of the box with either a WordPress plugin or a hosted platform. And so if you're on a hosted platform, that's it. And if that fits what you need, that's great because that does take a lot of the pain out of running stuff. Yeah. And like the tough thing about membership sites specifically is that 
it's not like a website where, you know, if you build your website in Squarespace this year, you could always migrate to a WordPress site next year. Like migrating a membership site is a huge pain. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got recurring payments alone. Like that's just not to mention like all the user accounts, like everything. Yeah. It's tough. And we do that sometimes. Um, usually that's like within WordPress, but from one plugin to another, it's challenging. And the payments thing is a whole other, like if people are coming from like PayPal, which I wish PayPal could disappear, but you know, it's there. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, even just the accounts, like issuing all your members new logins and passwords when you move to a new system. It's risky. Like it's, you're going to lose people when you do something like that, for sure. Right. So I guess that's another argument for using WordPress. It is adaptable. Like, and even going from like one WordPress plugin to a different WordPress plugin, completely different system, but it's still built on the same kind of database and it's easier to migrate things back and forth. Yeah. And most of those, most of the membership plugins, if you're not changing payment providers, then that's actually, it's all relative, but that's actually pretty easy to do, like to move from one to another, you know, plugin. Because that's really scriptable. You know, you can automate most of that. So what are some of like the big players right now in, in membership for WordPress? So the ones that are pretty big and that, that I like are generally Restrict Content Pro. It's my go-to. Uh, first one I look at. Other ones that I like and that are pretty popular are Member Press. Uh, another one is Member Full, which is kind of an interesting hybrid like WordPress plugin, but hosted. Like it runs on their own like Rails app on the back end. What's the benefit of that? Um... One is ease of use. You know, it's pretty good to set up if you're just running like a straight up content, like a pretty straightforward site where you're just restricting access to some content and that you don't need much custom stuff. And they have a really nice kind of account management system that, that's built into that. So that's kind of cool. Another huge one is WooCommerce. If you add in, there's a subscriptions add on and a memberships add on. That's great. It can be overkill for a lot of people. But if you have any need to sell like any physical products, then it's really good because you're already doing that with something like WooCommerce. I didn't know that WooCommerce could actually build a whole membership. Yeah, there's quite a few sites built on that. It, and like I said, it can be overkill and this is getting better, but WooCommerce kind of has a history of upgrades being challenging, <laughs> introducing some breakage and they just went through a huge upgrade that was really rough. But now getting on it now, then it's in a pretty good place to be. How about like integrating with other tools, whether it's Stripe? I mean, I assume all these plugins are integrating with Stripe these days. Yeah, pretty much Stripe is a, a given. Usually Stripe and Braintree are like a total given and PayPal usually. And then stuff like most of them will integrate with something like Authorize.net, you know, some of those other bigger legacy payment providers. Why would anybody even start with Authorize.net these days? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> usually I run into that when it's, or some other processors when it's, bigger companies, there's enterprise, you know, requirements and they get good negotiated rates and stuff like that. And, and they've been in business for like 15 years before all the exactly. tools came out. Yes. But uh, there's usually either third party or first party add-ons to these membership plugins to integrate with payment processors or affiliate platforms and plugins. Tons. I mean, there's usually tons of of integration, you know, different things you can integrate with outside services. Yeah. And then integrating the forum or a Slack room with your membership to a point where if somebody is an active paying member on the WordPress plugin, like do any of these plugins actually integrate with discourse? Cause I know that's a separate system. Yeah. So of those memberful is the only one that like natively integrates with discourse where it has like that two way integration where they keep it synced. So that is a nice thing in favor of memberful, but there's also discourse has like an official WordPress plugin. So it does single sign on. So when someone, like you said, discourse has to be live on its own, like usually a subdomain because it's a Rails app. But then when they go to sign on, if they're logged into WordPress, then they're good because it uses that single sign on. Right. And your membership would say whether or not they can log into WordPress or not. Exactly. Yeah. Although usually, you know, when people cancel, they're still WordPress members. And so probably, you know, theoretically, technically, they could still log into Discourse. There's not something doing that two way yet. I should probably just build a plugin that does that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that Discourse plugin is nice because you can do some other cool stuff with like comments on the site being Discourse topic threads and stuff like that. I was checking out this other tool recently. I haven't tried it myself, but I've been looking at it called uh, slackpass.io. Hmm, I haven't seen that one. Which essentially just attaches a membership component on top of a Slack account. Yeah, that's cool. Where you, you can build members 
on a monthly basis. And when they're stopped billing, it'll automatically kind of kick them out of the Slack or give members access to a private channel in a Slack, which looks pretty cool. I, I thought about that seems like a low hanging fruit. Like if I were to just launch just a Slack community at some point, like a paid Slack community, that could be a, a cool little thing. But then again, I don't know how much I could integrate that with say a WordPress site. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and I've seen other solutions for like automating that Slack invitation and adding process. There's some cool stuff there. Nice. Well, Travis, this has been really helpful. It certainly gave me a lot to think about here. So um, well, that's awesome. So memberup.co is your site. The book is over there. You guys can check that out. What else can people kind of find you? If people want to, they can find me on Twitter, T Northcut. there. You won't find necessarily tons of stuff about membership sites there. Usually more like GIFs. It's kind of my my thing there. But I always love hearing from people and engaging with people. So, um, And I'll throw up a, a landing page with a lot of the links we've talked about, memberup.co slash productize, so people can get to stuff from there too. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. We'll get that linked up in the show notes. And put a discount too on there for the book if anybody's interested. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you're thinking about putting up a membership site or moving to a membership model, Travis is definitely, you want to get on it. So um, so yeah, Travis, thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. I I enjoyed it, Brian, a whole lot. All right. Thanks, man. Hey, before you go, have you checked out my YouTube channel yet? I've been posting short videos where I answer questions that come in from readers of my newsletter. You got a question that you want me to answer? It could be about business, entrepreneurship, productizing, life, whatever. Hit reply on any of the emails that I sent you recently and I'll add it to the queue. What's up? You're not on my newsletter yet? Well, get on it. Head over to my site, castjam.com. That's where you'll find it. Okay, until next time. See you.